Thank you very much. So welcome everybody to this virtual time series seminar. And I'm uh, very pleased to introduce you Swazini Subbarau from <clears throat> Texas A&M that I thank for accepting our invitation to give a talk. And let me thank also Sumanta Bazu and uh, Jonas Krampe from Cornell University that are here and uh, in, in, in as guest panelists. Um, as usual, uh, we would like to uh, ask you to keep the substantial question to the end uh, of the talk. But if you have any clarification issues or you would like to ask anything to Swazini during the talk, please feel free to either write in the chat, but also to unmute, pop up and ask the question. Swazini is happy to go ahead. So thank you very much, Swazini. The floor is yours. So, um, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for um, sort of turning up and seeing it. And I immediately see a typo over here. I spelled seminar wrong. Um, so this is joint work with Shamantha Basu, who should come online or maybe online at some point. He's very busy. And also Jonas Kramper, who, who is out there in the audience already. Um, what I want to do is sort of start with, so basically, this is sort of a quick overview of my talk. I'm going to start with motivating example. And then I'm going to sort of give you some background, which probably most of you know on um, graphical models. And this background will somehow help build up and motivate what we intend to do in the talk. So if you already know the stuff, please bear with me. Um, but it does help motivate what we want to do in, in, in the late latter part of the talk. Okay, so let's start with this motivating example. Um, so here we have a multivariate time series of dimension four observed over a thousand, um, thousand time points. And if I zoom in, you'll see a couple of features which are quite striking. The first one is that all the components in the time series sort of move in some sense together, which is sort of immediately or strongly suggests there is sort of correlation going on between the time series. The other thing that you notice is that the volatility or the variation at the start of the time series is uh, very different to the variation at the end. Again, this is suggesting that the time series is sort of non-stationary and, and it's sort of evolving, the sort of dynamics are evolving in some sense over time. Okay, so this is what we're seeing visually. If you wanted to test this formally, you could, we could formalize and make tests. The null being would be, if you want to test the correlation, we would say, okay, there is no correlation between the time series. The alternative would be that there is correlation. If we want to look for stationarity or non-stationarity features, we could say, okay, well, the null hypothesis is that the four time series are all um, jointly um, stationary. And again, just to sort of set up what we're going to talk about, what we mean by this, we mean second order stationary, which tells us that the, if you look at the correlation or the covariance between this time point here and say this time point over here, that only depends upon the lag T minus two. That's what we mean by second order stationary here. Against the alternative that they are second order non stationary, uh, meaning that in some sense the covariance structure is sort of evolving or changing over time. And so now the covariance between time point T and time point tau is a function of t and tau individually. Okay, so this is a formalization, but if you look at the time series, as I said, you can see it. You can visually see that they are um, correlated and you can visually see that they are clearly, um, clearly non-stationary. So this leads us to sort of maybe looking, going away from pairwise relationships. That means looking to see whether the two time series are sort of pairwise correlated or whether two time series are pairwise stationary to something like systems wide, where we actually want to know what are the dependencies between the two time series after taking into account all the other time series, right? So here we would ask like, how does, Xt and Xt, how do they depend on, sorry, X, uh, component one and component two, how these two things depend on each other after we take into account, say, component two and four, okay? So this is what we mean by conditional or system-wise relationship. And if you have some idea of graphical models, you know, as soon as we start looking at sort of conditional relationships, we are sort of in the world of um, ga um, ga graphical models. So what I want to do now is sort of slightly take a slight distraction and sort of review what 
So the classical result in, in Gaussian graphical models, and also the sort of the more recent, but I would say classical results with time series stationary graphical glass models. And this will sort of give us the basis on how to sort of build, um, build on those ideas to the non-stationary framework. Okay, so let's start with sort of multivariate analysis. Um, so not time series, we just have one random vector X and it's p-dimensional made up of p components. And to make things a little bit easier, we're assuming it's Gaussian, but this is not necessary, okay? And this random vector over here is going to have um, the variance matrix sigma, which will be useful later on in this discussion. So if I want to define the conditional network or the conditional graph, if I've given a p-dimensional um, vector, I need to have p nodes here. So this would, if, it's four, if p is equal to four, I would have four nodes, each node corresponding to one entry in my vector, to one of those random variables over here. Okay, so this is my vertex set. And then I need to define my edge set, which is basically defined by the conditional structure of, of um, the conditional relationships in this random vector. To do that, I need to define a new vector, which is a subset of my original vector. My new vector contains all the entries of my old vector, but I remove the two nodes that interest me. Okay, the node A and B, if I want to look at what's happening between vertex A and vertex B. So this set, this, this is a p-dimensional vector, this is going to be a p minus two-dimensional vector, which contains all the entries but A and B. Okay, and this is going to be used to define my conditional relationship. So I define my partial covariance or my conditional covariance between um, node A or the, the, the um, random variable at node A and the random variable at node B conditioned on all the others. And if this conditional variance or the partial covariance is not equal to zero, then I'm going to, so this is A and this is B, and if it's not equal to zero, then I'm going to put an edge between A and B. But if say the conditional variance between say node A and node C is zero, then I don't put an edge between it. So basically, what this tells us is that there is still a sort of correlation or, or dependence, if you were in the Gaussian world, between A and B, even after conditioning. And that's why I have an edge in my graph. And that's why we call it a sort of a conditional network. OK, so this is the definition of the network. And it's kind of useful to understand conditional relationships. Um, the next question is, is how do we sort of estimate this network given data? And to do that, we usually go to sort of the workhorse of, I would say, GGM, which is the precision matrix. If you remember, the precision matrix is the variance covariance matrix, the P by P matrix inverted. So that's the precision matrix over here. And there's a very sort of simple but elegant relationship which ties the conditional correlation to the precision matrix. And that basically says, if the um, conditional covariance between A and B condition on the other other entries in the vector, if this is equal to zero, then if you look at the corresponding entry in the inverse of the variance matrix, position matrix, that would be equal to zero. And it's an if and only relationship. If the entry in the matrix is equal to zero, then the conditional covariance is equal to zero. So for example, if this entry here is equal to zero, that means if we have an edge set one and two, we do not put an edge between one and two. Okay, so, so now we already meet see that how we can go about sort of estimating the conditional covariance. We just get the precision, we estimate precision matrix and try to look to see or sort of test whether um, the entries in that are zero or not equal to zero. One way of doing the estimation of the precision, precision matrix is to use another sort of classical trick used in multivariate analysis. And that is basically using the idea of regression. The coefficients in regression are closely related to the entries in the precision matrix. In particular, what we have is that if you look at the, um, the node A, and you regress it on all the other variables. So you have a linear regression where you regress on all the variables, and you want to see if um, there is a relationship or a non-zero conditional correlation between A and B, then you look at the corresponding coefficient. And if that coefficient is zero, that means the conditional correlation between A and B is equal to zero. Conversely, if the conditional covariance is equal to zero, then this coefficient is zero. 
Okay, so one can sort of elucidate this conditional relationships from A, looking at the position matrix and looking for zeros in the position matrix, and B, equivalently to doing linear regression and looking to see whether the coefficients are zero or not. Okay, so this is sort of standard stuff that you would say maybe tell undergraduates in multivariate analysis. What we want to do now is to now review some sort of more recent results, which generalize these ideas to those of um, time series. And before I do that, I just want to add that we usually call this what the approach I've just described to you, Gaussian graphical model, um, but one can easily drop the condition of Gaussianity. The only thing that you do then is that now you don't look at the idea of conditional independence, you look at the idea of conditional uncorrelatedness. Okay, so you drop the stronger condition for a little bit weaker one. Okay, so now we're in the time series realm, which is sort of what, what the domain of this sort of seminar series is on. And we're going to assume that we're in a multivariate time series where the covariance between x t and x tau is stationary. That means the function of t minus tau, just the lag difference over here. Um, now that we're in a sort of time series context, we don't only have covariance between the entries of the random vector, we also have sort of correlation between different time points, the so lead lag relationships as well. Okay. Um, so now the question is, is how do I define a sort of a, a sort of conditional network in the context of a time series, which takes into account not just the contemporaneous dependence, con conditional contemporaneous covariances, but also all the lead lag relationships. To do that, I just will use a, a sort of just sort of introduce a spectral density function, which is the workhorse, I would say, of um, stationary graphical Gaussian models. The spatial density matrix, sorry, is the Fourier transform of the autocovariance. Okay, and so this is going to be very useful. It's a p by p matrix corresponding to the dimension of the time series, where the entries are going to be very useful to us. And I'll scream to you why in a second. Okay, so this is a sideshow. I will come back to this in, in a, a couple of minutes. And let's go back to the problem at hand. How do I define the graph for a time series? Um, now, to do that, we need to sort of sort of define our sort of our, our, our linear space on which we condition. Okay, so we're interested in how to define the conditional relationship between node A and node B of the time series, say between node A and say node B of the time series. But we want to take into account that there's covariance over the entire time. So when we define our conditioning set, we it's no longer a P minus two um, uh, dimensional space, it's going to be an infinite dimensional space, in, including all the time series, all the lags, but we're removing node A and B. So that's what you mean here, right? So basically, this is the entire time series. So it's basically, it's just the P minus two dimensional time series, all, all lags, okay? So it's infinite dimensional space. And then now the condition covariance for a time series says, okay, what is the covariance between, say, node A at time point T and node B at time point tau when you condition all the other time series? Okay, so all the other time series are all other time points. This is the partial covariance now for in the multivariate setup. So we can use this notion to define our conditional graph, which sort of mimics all the notions I described to you for Gaussian graphical models. Basically, we have, again, a, a, an edge set, I mean, sorry, a vertex set, in this case, four dimensions. So this would be one, two, three, four. And then we put an edge between, say, one and four over here. If, if I look at the, if I, at any point t or tau, there is a covariance between t and tau. So there's non-zero covariance. So if I see it for some t and tau, there is a covariance between one and four after conditioning on all the time series, doesn't matter which one it is, there is at some t and tau, there is a covariance. Then I put an edge between one and two. If on the other hand, the, I look at the covariance between say um, um, one and two over here, and I um, and I look at all T and tau, and there is no covariance between them, then I don't put an edge here, okay? So this is sort of a generalization of exactly the Gaussian graphical models now, but for, but to the, the to time series. Okay, so that's the sort of definition. The question is how to do the estimation. 
And as I mentioned, the precision matrix is the workhorse for Gaussian graphical models, and it is the workhorse also for for time series Gaussian graphical models or time series graphical models. Um, but the way we do that, our, our sort of workhorse now is not to play within the time domain where things get a bit awkward, is to go into the frequency domain. So the precision matrix that we use in um, stationary um, Gaussian graphical models is that we get the spectral density matrix and we invert it. So we have the spectral precision matrix and we look at the entries of this. The only thing that's different to classical GGM is now this is a function of omega. And then there's a classical result that basically says, if for example, this coefficient is equal to zero for all omega, then that tells us that there's no conditional covariance between say node one and node two after doing the conditioning at any t in tau. Okay, and if this, on the other hand, if this coefficient is not equal to zero for some omega, then there is a conditional covariance between them of some t and tau, okay? So the idea would be to sort of get, estimate a spectral density matrix, invert it, get an estimated precision matrix, and then sort of locate or try to estimate to test, test whether the entries are zero or not. Okay, um, and again, often the way one would go about this is to, um, to, to use regression. But whereas in Gaussian graphical models, we do the regression by using the raw of random variables for stationary time series, we don't do the regression using the raw random variables, we take the linear transformation of it. We basically get the time series and take its Fourier transform, and this Fourier transform is just a sine and a cosine transform that's evaluated at sort of all the frequencies or a frequency grid between zero and two pi over here. So basically this would be two pi over n, where n is the sample size, this would be two pi times two over n. So this is basically the coefficients or the frequencies we're going to evaluate the DFT at. Okay, so this is now, I would say, our new data. And because it's sort of known that if you look at the variance of this data, you basically get the spectral density matrix. Um, we can now, sort of estimate the entries of the spectral density matrix by regressing the DFT at one node on all the other nodes, okay? This will basically sort of estimate a rescaled version of the entries of the spectral density matrix. And so this is what we do over here. If I want to understand the conditional dependence structure between node A and all the other nodes, I basically look at frequency K and at node A and regress um, the DFTs on all the other nodes at the same frequency and look in particular at the coefficient. And, and it, it's sort of well known if this coefficient here is zero for all K, so between the, 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 the this is the node corresponding to sort of the um, node B over here, then, um, and then basically node A and node B are conditionally cor uncorrelated after taking into account all the other, um, other time series. So the idea would be in practice is to try to estimate this using linear regression in some sense, and then do some sort of testing on that. Okay, so this is really very, very understood in the, in the low dimension. It's sort of semi being covered by uh, Mikhail Eichler and Rainer von Sachs. And more recently, people have been sort of generalizing these notions to the high dimensional setup. Um, so I refer to you to the recent papers of Mark Fikas, um, Shimanka Basu, the one of my collaborators, and um, Jonas Kramper and, um, and Parvadita. So, so these, these, these papers here cover specifically the situation of trying to estimate, I would say, or especially the latter two, estimating the network in, in high dimensions. Okay, so this is our sort of review. And hopefully this will help us understand what I'm going to explain in the next 30 or so minutes. Um, this is trying to generalize all these ideas now to multivariate time series, which is no longer stationary. So, so the overview of this talk is that we're going to look now at a multivariate time series, um, but it's no longer stationary in the sense that we're not imposing the condition that if you look at the covariance between t and tau, that's a function of the lag, okay? It's just a function of t and tau separately. So we've dropped the stationarity condition. And that means that the stuff I've just described to you earlier would, if it applied to this type of data, would give you completely misspecified network. So what we want to do is sort of define sort of, I would say, correct networks that describe really the correlation structure for the non-stationary setup. 
um, that's sort of our aim. Um, there are some complications coming through, and I need to sort of describe these this, a little bit, okay? Um, I haven't really sort of mentioned this much, but even in the stationary context, when you're sort of dealing with um, uh, uh, sort of a time series, or con constructing co a network for a time series, um, your position matrix is no longer finite dimensional. It's infinite dimension. So this makes things very, very tricky to estimate. Um, so you, really, you sort of have to find tricks that sort of allow you to do the estimation in this really high dimensional world that wouldn't be there in even when P is small for, for, the, for the sort of the multivariate case. And, and to do that, we're going to use tools analogous in some sense to those used in stationary GGM. Our workhorse is going to be basically the DFT again. And that means, and I just emphasize, even though we're in a non-stationary environment, we're going to look at the time series and take the DFT of the entire time series. And so the, I would say the sort of the summary of our talk is we're going to show that again, using the technique of regression, we can elucidate the conditional relationships for a non-stationary time series. However, the big difference is when we do the regression, we have to not just, if we're looking at the conditional relationships between A and all the other nodes, we shouldn't just regress on all the other nodes at the same frequency, which is done for stationary um, graphical models. We also need to include the neighboring frequencies, okay? If you combine these together, the coefficients of this linear regression can sort of describe quite interesting, I would say, um, relationships for non-stationary um, non multivariate time series. And these are, which I'll sort of define to you a little bit later on, are again, the notions of conditional uncorrelatedness, exactly like that one I described for stationary graphical model. But also we have, and so I would say a new relationship that once you start working with non-stationary data, when you start doing the conditioning, you can find situations that the, after conditioning, you sort of get a stationary setup, okay? So you can, we, you can sort of define the notion of conditional stationarity and conditional non-stationarity. And these things I'll make precise a little bit later on. Okay. So that's sort of quite high level. What I want to do is start with sort of a, the nitty gritty, a sort of very concrete example and um, the sort of network for these concrete examples. So let's start in the stationary framework and a classical VAR model. Though I should emphasize what we are doing is not just for VAR models, it can sort of work for any non-stationary time series, but, but VAR helps us sort of fix our, our ideas nicely. So here we have a four dimensional VAR model well, we have a lot of zeros and a few coefficients over here. And if you look at back at the papers of Berlinger and Dahlhaus, they show that if the errors here have a, a sort of, um, have a variance, which is I4 as so of identity, and then the so the the so, um, the, the graph or the network corresponding to this bar model is determined by the transition matrix, the bar transition matrix. You can basically show that this bar transition matrix corresponds to this network over here. If you want to know why, you basically work out the inner product between the um, columns, and if the inner product is non-zero, then you basically put an edge between them. Okay, so this um, transition matrix corresponds to this um, um, conditional graph. What I want to do now is now sort of non stationify this VAR model by making some of these coefficients non-zero. And in fact, just making two of them non-zero. If I do that, I've made this coefficient non-zero and this coefficient non-zero. And this is a realization of this VAR model where these coefficients uh, some sort of have some sort of smooth transition going on in here. And so you see immediately just making these two coefficients non-zero, but keeping everything else constant, it, this, non, this sort of, this, this sort of non-stationary sort of creeps through the entire network. And we basically get a sort of all the components are completely non-stationary. And you can visually see that. Okay. But if you think about it a little bit and you sort of, um, sort of, um, sort of notice, you've noticed that if you look at say, two and four, these two um, components, they are sort of inheriting in some sense a non-stationarity from one and three, okay? You're not seeing that clearly in the realization and you won't see that in any of the pairwise structures. 
But the question you might ask yourself is if I start doing the conditioning in, in the correct way, will I see that two and four are inheriting in some sense a non-stationarity, say from one and three? And that's really what we want to do right now. Okay, so now let's just compare our two different network, I mean, two different time series, the stationary time series and the non-stationary time series. We know for sure this is the network for the stationary time series, since basically the transition matrix and non-stationary setup sort of mirrors this, except now the time, the params are time varying. It sort of doesn't take too imagination to sort of guess that the same, this would be the conditional network for the non-stationary setup. Um, so the first question we ask is, is this the correct network? The next question we might ask ourselves is, this is a little bit stranger, is, okay, well, this is the network for the stationary time series. And if this is the true network for non-stationary time series, I can't see a difference between these two networks. This network over here doesn't really tell me that the underlying time series is non-stationary, okay? It only tells me that an edge should be there if it's true, if they're conditionally non-zero. So what I would like my graph to do is to tell me more information, given that I now have a time series which is non-stationary. I would like maybe... Uh, so, so Sorry? See, uh, yes? uh, you know, it's, uh, a comment uh, maybe makes sense, may, maybe not. Okay. So, uh, can we can we talk about sort of spurious network or sort of like a network that is driven by co-integration here? No. No. So you will see that, that this does not allow for what I'm talking about does not allow the co-integrated setup. Okay, because... You, can, you can do it, but what I'm going to define is not going to allow for that. I don't know, this is more an e-com sort of a seminar talk, so it's really... Yeah, optimistic. I mean, just because, you know, yeah. you, you deal with non-stationary data and you deal with the, you know, variance, covariance matrix, that's a sort of like, you know, you have, you deal with the sort of regression. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether this con can be connected to sort of like, so, you know, we can identify spurious network versus like integrated uh, sort of network from, from- So this is exactly what a referee asked us. Uh -huh. um, and it was a very good question. Uh -huh. So the answer is yes and no. Okay. Not exactly in what we're doing, but it is potentially possible, but it, you don't get the answer you would want to get. That's what I want to say. You, that And I can sort of, sort of um, and blemish on this a little bit later on. Yeah, I'm not talking about this. Maybe like as an extension, maybe like, you know. Potentially, you know, yeah. maybe. I don't want to say yes or no if I really don't know for sure. Thank you, thanks. But the, the question is excellent. Okay, so, so what we want to do now is we want somehow this network to um, convey information about um, about conditional relationships that go beyond just whether something is um, con um, it, it, whether something is um, conditionally correlated or not. Okay, um, and so here is the sort of the definition slide, and um, it's a little bit overwhelming, but I'll sort of try to make it a bit easier later on. It's just more notation than anything else. Okay, so this is now how I would like to define the network, or how we we suggest defining the network. Um, first thing, just to mirror exactly what is done in stationary time series, we have a so, sorry, we have a network. Um, say, say A, B, and C over here. So just a three-dimensional, um, multivariate three-dimensional time series. Um, and we don't put an edge between A and B if after conditioning on C at all the lags in time, um, there is no correlation, okay? So this is exactly, exactly analogous to what we talked about earlier. Um, but then we are going to introduce sort of two additional notions, which I would say are a little bit new. And this is the following. We have again A and B and um, A, B and C. And we put a circle around A if after conditioning A on B and C, so that basically means I look at the covariance between X, T and X, tau at node A, after conditioning on all the other nodes, in this case, B and C over here, if this covariance now is just a function of t minus tau, then I say that this node here is conditionally stationary. What it basically says is that in some sense, once I finish the conditioning, 
now this I don't have stationarity in A anymore. It's I mean not stationarity in A. It's so sort of, I've turned my object into a stationary object. But in a similar spirit, I would put a, a sort of a solid line between say. Oops, let me let me make this a little bit easier. I would put a solid line between um, B and C if when I condition between B and C over here, if I look at the covariance between A, sorry, A and B over here, after conditioning on C, if that covariance basically is a function of T minus tau, then I say that um, this edge is conditionally time invariant. I mean, after I do the conditioning, then I'm sort of inducing stationarity again. Okay, so this is saying like, even though our entire network is pairwise non-stationary, if I start doing the conditioning on everything else, I'm sort of getting back to stationarity. And then we say an edge is either a node or an edge is conditionally non-stationary. And, and to, so, so to sort of illustrate that, we now put sort of a circle around them or a circle between a, a sort of a dash, sorry, a dash around them or a dash between them. If even after we do the conditioning, we still have covariance structures which depend upon t and tau individually and not just the lag t minus tau. Okay, and so this sort of in some sense defines an analogous version of conditional network to those for stationary time series, but also tells us in some sense whether um, after conditioning we have sort of got drawn back or got back stationarity. So the idea would be, and this is just sort of a, a toy example, we would have nodes A, B, C, D, and E, and we would put solid edges around them here. If once we do the conditioning on everything else, they, they become stationary. Um, but they, these would have like um, a sort of a, a dashed edge if we do the conditioning and they are non-stationary. And then we basically, we would put dashed lines between them if they are time varying, or this is say here's time varying edge like this um, and so forth. So, so when you see a graph like that, you might see, when you look at that graph, you may say, okay, well actually B and C are somehow the source of non-stationarity. These are the ones that are sort of driving the non-stationarity within our network. And A, C and E are sort of inheriting the non-stationarity from, from B and C. Okay, so this is sort of the idea to construct networks like that. Um, if you go back to our running example, this is the four dimensional network I just showed you. Um, you see that this, this coefficient here is um, time varying and this coefficient here is time varying. If you look, you can show by doing a Koleski decomposition that the conditional network corresponding to this VAR model over here, so long as this, the variance of the innovation is identity, is basically this network back here. Again, it tells us that conditionally, one, even after condition and everything else, is still non-stationary, three, no three, even after condition and everything else is still non-stationary, but two and four, after I do the conditioning, then they actually become stationary. And moreover, the edges here are, when I do the conditioning, then the edge is still, um, these, these edges over here, they become non-time varying. Okay, so this, I think this graph sort of nicely illustrates this, this, um, this network in, in, in some sense. Okay, so this is the definition. Now, now sort of addressing some of the questions that you already asked me, um, what are the assumptions for to make sure all this stuff works? And so to do that, we need to sort of get a little bit technical over here. Remember, everything now is depending upon the position matrix, which I told you is, is sort of the workhorse of um, Gaussian models, or graphical models. And, and to get the position matrix, we need to start off with the covariance matrix. Okay, but because we're dealing with a multivariate time series, our covariance matrix is a little bit trickier than what is usually used. So what we have now is our covariance matrix, but a covariance matrix is basically a P by Pili block matrix, where the entries in each of these blocks is an infodimensional um, matrix. Okay, and this basically, this, for example, this one over here, C11, will contain all the covariances between um, node one to itself. C12 is containing all the cross covariances between node one and node two, um, node two over T, T and tau, and that's why it's interdimensional. Okay, um, so the difference between classical GGM and now what we're playing with, the object we're playing with, is in classical GGM, this is a finite dimensional matrix, and in, in sort of this set of network setup we're dealing with, this is a is a P by P block matrix, matrix, matrix where each entry is infinite dimensional. 
Okay, now the major condition that we're going to be using, and this is why we can't allow for co-integration, at least in the set that we're dealing with right now, is that the eigenvalues of this operator, of this matrix over here, they are bounded away from infinity, that sort of doesn't allow the co-integrated case, and also they're bounded away from zero. And the fact that it's bounded away from zero is very useful for us because it allows us to invert the matrix and consider the position matrix. So this condition of being bounded away from zero is actually the condition that we really, really need. Okay. And so now if you think about it, um, we, if the position matrix for this operator over here is the inverse of this covariance matrix, and what I want to show you now is this conditional, this sort of these definitions I've just defined to you earlier, they are basically encoded within the inverse of this matrix over here. Okay. Um, so here are so the relationships. So we have the covariance operator, this is P by P block matrix, so a block operator over here. We're going to invert it. This is our infinite dimensional precision matrix. And we're going to look at the entries of this. So each entry is a P by P block matrix where each entry is now infinite dimensional. And basically, you can show that. If, for example, D12 is an infinite dimensional zero matrix, then that tells us that node A and B in our network, that means our, our conditionally uncorrelated after conditioning and everything else. So if this object is zero, then these the two time series are conditionally uncorrelated. In the similar spirit, node A, so look, say, for example, node 1 is conditionally stationary if actually this um, infinite dimensional matrix over here is toplets. And if you remember, a toplets matrix is a matrix which is just defined by one sequence, which all the subsequent rows are as just a shift of that sequence. If this is a toplets matrix, then node A is conditionally stationary. In a similar spirit, if, if, if the edge is between node one and two is conditionally time invariant, then we say that um, then that corresponds to being this matrix over here being a topless matrix, 2, 1 being a topless matrix. On the other hand, a node edge or a node B is conditionally non-stationary if, say, um, this matrix or this matrix is um, no longer topless. So what we've just done now is we've restated these conditional relationships in terms of partial covariances, now in terms of topless and non-topless and zero structures of the precision matrix. Okay. Um, now, as you can imagine, this is a nice mathematical definition, but if you want to estimate this object, it's sort of near impossible. It's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to estimate this operator over here based upon just one multivariate time series. So what we're going to do is to do exactly what we did, what was done in stationary um, graphical model, I mean, stationary time series graphical models. We're going to move into the Fourier domain and there in the Fourier domain, relationships become a lot more sparse or nicer. And so we can actually estimate within the Fourier domain um, sparse relationships, which are feasible and thus learn the network. Um, and so now what I want to do, if, I, if you may allow me to, is to sort of give you an idea why this should potentially work, why moving in the Fourier domain should allow us in some sense to um, obtain sparse relationships. And to, so this is another sort of distraction to go a little bit, but I hope it gives you insights into what we're going to do. I want to show how if you have a time series and it's second order stationary or second order non-stationary, and we look at the DFTs of that time series, the covariance of the DFTs have a very, very clear structure uh, and allow us to delinear late between, say, stationarity and non-stationarity, okay? And this is just for pairwise relationships. What I will do later on is to show that conditional relationships also hold in a similar way. Okay, but pairwise is sort of, I would say, at the very beginning, easier to understand. So let's start with a simple example over here. Suppose we have XT and it's a second order multivariate time, so I just put a line under here. A line in the here over here. So we have XT is, is a second order multivariate time series, and I take the DFT of it, okay? And this is a sine and cosine transform of it, evaluated frequencies omega k. So this is a, the DFT at node A, and this is the DFT of the, of the entire vector over here. So this would be a vector over here. And if my time series is 
second order stationary. That means the covariance is just a function of the shift of t minus tau. And I calculate the covariance between the DFT at frequency k and the DFT at frequency k plus r. This covariance, if r is not equal to zero, will approximately be equal to zero. Whereas if I look at r is equal to zero, then I just have the variance of the DFT and I get back the spectral density. So what we see, if you have a stationary time series, we, we evaluate the DFT of the stationary time series. The DFT of the stationary time series, if it's stationary, is almost uncorrelated. So the DFT almost uncorrelates in line time series. If I were to, now what I want to do is do the same thing, but represent this in a, in a matrix format, right? So that basically says, I'm going to get my DFT at node A, and I'm looking at frequency one to frequency n. So I'm going to now define an n-dimensional vector, just my f of t of my, of my data, at node A. So this is an n-dimensional vector over here. And then I'm going to concatenate all my vectors together. Okay, so this is the DFTs at all frequencies in node one. These are DFTs at all frequencies in node two. The DFTs at all frequencies in node B. So this is an n times p dimensional vector. And I'm going to evaluate the variance of this DFT. You get quite a nice structure. If you basically get sort of a block matrix, suppose P is equal to three, you now get a block matrix. Okay, this is my unpleasantly looking block matrix. And each of my blocks is going to be n by n dimensional. So each of these blocks is going to be n by n dimensional. If my time series is second order stationary, the block matrix have a very clear structure. They all will be basically diagonal. You'll see this around there. They're all these block matrix, I'll have basically a block diagonal matrix. Okay. Um, and this is basically a property of, of stationarity. Conversely, if my time series is second order non-stationary, and I do exactly the same thing, and I look at the variance of my DFT, just the sort of, so I'm looking at basically the pairwise relationships between my DFTs, my, my matrix will no longer be blocked. It, I will have correlations on the off diagonal as well. And that's very important. And, and so a dichotomy between checking for stationarity and checking for non-stationarity, you could just look at the DFTs, look for the correlations in the DFTs and see whether you have a diagonal matrix or non-diagonal matrix. So this gives the background on how to learn conditional relationships. Here, I've just talked about pairwise relationships and looking to see whether a time series is stationary or non-stationary, okay? Um, but this dichotomy can be used to check for pairwise stationarity. What I'm going to show you now is I can use the same idea. I can look at my DFTs. I can get my same n by p um, vector, dimensional vector over here. I can evaluate the variance of it, but because I'm interested in conditional relationships, I'm going to invert the variance of my DFT. And the inverse of the variance of my DFT is going to contain all the conditional relationships I've just described to you. It's going to tell us whether two things after conditioning are, are two time series after conditioning are zero or not. It's going to tell us also if if two time series after conditioning are stationary or not, in the same way I've just described you for the pairwise relationship. Okay, so let me sort of make this a little bit more precise. Here's my n by p, um, n times p um, dimension, oh, sorry, np dimensional vector, um, and it's of my DFTs over here. I'm going to take the inverse of it, and I basically get now a p by p block matrix, where each of my blocks is n by n dimensional. It sounds confusing, but it's not, not really. Um, and each of these entries over here is going to describe the conditional relationships between the corresponding entries. So for example, kn12 is going to describe the conditional relationship between time series one and time series two after conditioning. Okay, and basically you can show if, if a and b are conditionally uncorrelated, then the corresponding entry, that matrix over the entry AB is going to be a zero, roughly speaking, a zero, a zero matrix over here. That's going to have just with zeros, almost zeros everywhere. Similarly, if the node A is conditionally stationary, we look at the corresponding matrix, the, the inverse DFT matrix and the one that corresponds to node A, this will be a diagonal matrix, 
So it's analogous to the pairwise relationship I've just talked to you about. If node A and B are conditionally time varying, then we're going to have a, um, a diagonal matrix again for entry A, B. And if A or B, if we're looking at A and it's conditionally non-stationary, if I look at the corresponding inverse matrix, this should be basically a non-diagonal matrix. That means you're going to have non-zero entries off the diagonal. And so it turns out to be easier to estimate the relationships in the in uh, looking at the position matrix of the inverse of the df um, the variance of the dft than looking at actually the covariance structures itself because basically we've described these conditional relationships between what I would say with sparse relationships or zero non-zero relationships. Okay, so let's go back to our running example. This is the VAR model, the time varying VAR model over here. This is the network I showed you corresponding to that transition matrix, and we see now that one is a conditionally non-stationary, so that corresponds to a non-zero, I mean, a, sorry, a non-zero matrix, which is non-diagonal. That means this matrix over here is going to have non-zero entries off the diagonal, whereas two is conditionally, station, conditionally stationary, so this is going to correspond to a diagonal matrix and so forth. Okay, so this sort of gives an idea of the conditional structure for the stationary case. The question is, is to do the estimation, we need to understand what the, um, the conditionally non-stationary matrix looks like. So this will have to have a specific structure for us to detect the non-stationarity. Um, to do that, we're going to start, so far I haven't imposed any conditions on my non-stationarity. I'm going to now impose a little bit stronger condition on my non-stationarity, and I'm going to assume that it's, it's locally stationary. And that basically means that the time series it changes over time or evolves slowly over time, or I could have change points, right? So it's, it's quite a wide class of non-stationary time series models. Um, but basically says the non-stationary system changes in some sense slowly over time. Now, to give you an example of that, for example, is in our running example, um, the time varying functions here, if it's, con if it's, if it's a locally stationary, this time varying function would change basically either smoothly over time. So this would be my alpha over time over here. This would be alpha, this would be my T, or it could also allow for change points. It doesn't really matter which one you want to go for. Okay, so these sort of, it, it allows for sort of in this sort of bar world that my coefficients change slowly over time. So this is an example of locally stationary in time series. Don't worry about this bit. It's just additional bit there. Okay, so now, in the locally stationary setup, if my node or my edge is time varying or conditionally non-stationary, the corresponding DFT matrix of the inverse will not be diagonal, but it will have a very specific non-diagonal structure. Basically tells us that the, it will, it, the main entries will lie on the diagonal. And if I go a little bit off the diagonal, so I go to a little bit off diagonal, the non-zero coefficients will be large, just off the diagonal. And as I go further away from the diagonal, these coefficients will taper around. So it has a very specific structure. This K matrix has a very specific structure in the case of local stationarity. And because it has a very specific structure, it allows us to consistently estimate the, um, the inverse of the DFT matrix um, in the case that we believe that our time series um, changes slowly over time. Okay, so, all right. So in so summary. So yes? you're, yeah, you're 10 minutes uh, more Okay, or less. I think I should be able to finish in three or four. Oh, that's perfect. I, I hope so at least. Okay. <laughs> um, so to give a summary, we have our DFT matrix. So we take the variance of that. And what we are looking for essentially is diagonal structures, zero structures, or non-diagonal structures where the main entries or large entries are just on the off diagonal of it. Okay, so that's kind of what we want to, would like to do. And again, like I missed, as I told you earlier, to do the estimation, estimating this, this isn't, remember, if you think about it, we have an NP by NP dimensional um, time series, and all we observe is just one time series of that length n. So to do the estimation, we need some sense, some sort of um, some, some way of doing that. I'll talk about later on. But to estimate the coefficients, we do regression. Okay. So the, the way we do the um, uh, the regression is that we 
the entries of precision matrix are related, closely related to if I did the regression of one DFT on all the other DFTs at the same frequency and all the neighboring frequencies. And I look at the coefficients of this. Okay, so this is at what happens at the population level. You can show that the entries in the regression are, um, if there is uncorrelatedness, the coefficient corresponding to the non-zero, um, the same frequency, but different coefficient uh, node will be zero. If it's conditionally stationary, we look at the off frequencies away from the diagonal, and we look to see whether these coefficients are zero. If these coefficients here are zero between A and B, then we say that the, um, so between A and A, this is conditionally um, stationary. In the same way, if we're looking at between the edge, um, if, this, if this is conditionally stationary or, or time varying, then these coefficients of the diagonal will be zero. And in the same way, if we have non-stationarity, conditional non-stationarity, some of these coefficients will be non-zero when you go off the diagonal. So basically what we can do without too much effort is to rewrite this, these quantities over here in terms of co coefficients in a regression. And the very last bit, and the estimation is a whole new story, so I won't talk about that, is how to do, at least do the estimation. Um, to do the estimation now, this is the tricky bit. We have an NP times NP dimensional matrix. We need to estimate the coefficients of that, probably either by inverting the matrix or doing regression. Um, this is almost impossible, but what we can do is to do some sort of truncation or regularization to get some, I, some sort of slightly biased estimator of the co coefficients. And this is basically what we do. We get our DFT of frequency K, K, and we regress on the same frequency and all the and just the neighboring frequencies. Okay, so it's like going up. If I look over here, I'm looking at this one over here, and I'm regressing a few coefficients here and off the diagonal over here. And then we can use least squares to do the estimation. And then from there, our hope is, and that's the future work, is to um, deduce the network from from the estimates of these coefficients from here. And I think I really talked for a very long time here. We have some simulations on this but I think I'm too tired to actually describe it. So what I'm going to do is just sort of end this at this point over here. Um, if you want the details of what I've described to you, everything we've talked about so far as the population level and how one could do the estimation is described in the paper with Shaman Tabasu. Um, if you want to understand how the structures of this sort of infant dimensional covariance operators, they behave, that's in the paper of Uranus over here. And what we're trying to do currently is really, or, almost finished, at least in the low dimensional set of estimating how to infer the network that I've just described to you using data, um, the finite dimensional data set, and that's the current work right now. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Swasini. And uh, so I think we can uh, stop recording now. And I would like to open the discussion if there are any questions or.